run assistive technology programs and lifespan respite, AT resources for family caregivers and respite care providers. Uh, my name is Jill Kagan, and as many of you know, I'm the director of the ARCH National Respite Network and Resource Center. Uh, in just a minute, I'm going to turn this over to Emily Turner, our wonderful webinar facilitator, who will provide a quick overview of the webinar platform. But before we get started, I just had a couple of announcements, very short announcements, uh, that I wanted to make. Uh, first, and very importantly, I want you all to know that the call for presentations for the 2019 National Lifespan Respite Conference is now open. And we will be accepting proposal submissions until September 1st. You can access the call for presentations and an online application. And we are accepting applications only online uh, right from the ARCH website at archrespite.org. That will take you to the conference website. And as always, we welcome proposals on any topic related to respite care for family caregivers. It can be research-related, <laughs> advocacy, innovative practices, state lifespan respite systems, wherever your uh, area of expertise falls. And we'll also have a track for family caregivers as well. Uh, as, as most of you also probably know, we're co-hosting the conference with the New York State Caregiving Respite and Respite Coalition and the New York State Office for the Aging, and we're very delighted to be partnering with them on this. It will be held in Buffalo, New York, right on the waterfront front, and within driving distance of Niagara Falls. Uh, the dates are uh, in the spring of 2019, the evening of uh, April 30th uh, through May 2nd, 2019. And the Lifespan Respite Grantee and Partner Learning Symposium, for those of you who are grantees and partners, will be held on April 30th, uh, the full day before the conference officially begins. And there's lots more uh, information about the conference on our website. Uh, the second announcement that I have is specifically uh, for you. If you're a Lifespan Respite Grantee and Partner, I want to remind you that we will still have a grantee and partner networking uh, call next week on Wednesday, July 18th at 2 o'clock Eastern. And the topic will be on state funding for respite services. Uh, and you should have received uh, the call-in information for that. And if not, uh, please email me and let me know, and I'll make sure that you get that. All is to check your email uh, immediately following the webinar that will direct you to a very quick survey that allows you to give us some feedback on today's webinar, and also gives you a chance to suggest topics for future webinars. And as always, we're really grateful for your input and really um, encourage you to um, take that quick survey. And we're really so pleased to welcome all of our speakers today from the Administration for Community Living, uh, the Assistive Technology Act Technical Assistance and Training Center, and three state presenters that are representing uh, assistive technology pro projects in Idaho and New Hampshire, and our own Alabama Lifespan Respite uh, project. So I'm going to turn it over now. Please welcome Victoria Wright, uh, the Federal Project Officer for the Lifespan Respite Care Program, and she's going to introduce today's speakers. Thank you, Victoria. Great. Um, thank you, Jill. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for attending this webinar. We have another exciting program that we have that we can learn more about this. This is another tool that will enable us to better serve our caregivers and care recipients. I'm very excited to have Rob Groendahl, uh, my colleague, um, and his team, uh, Marty, Krista, Stacy, and Cheryl, um, joining us to talk about the assistive technology program that he leads. As we all know, that Lifespan Respite Act defines Lifespan Respite Care as a coordinated system of accessible, community-based respite care service for family caregivers of children and adults with special need. State Lifespan Respite Program brings together an array of service and program to caregivers. One of this program is ACL's 
ACL's assistive technology program. This program supports the state's effort to improve the provision of assistive technology to individuals with disability of all ages. Today's webinar is a great opportunity to think about your state's assistive technology program and how your state can further enhance or create a partnership and collaborative and collaborate excuse me, with the AT program. Please take this opportunity to ask questions you may have about the AT program. I would like to thank um, my colleague again, Rob Garandol, Marty Axline, Krista Kramer, Stacey Driscoll, and Cheryl Smith for taking the time to educate us about this program. Um, I'm going to turn it back to you, Jill. Thank you. We can go right ahead uh, with our first speaker. Okay, so, so thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, also for advancing the slide. Good afternoon and of course good morning to everyone uh, on the West Coast. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, both Marty Exline and I are going to provide some background and context uh, for this discussion. So I want to start back with the Assistive Technology Act when it was, it was first authorized in 1988, housed at the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research, NIDR, and began with a focus on direct service. The law was reauthorized in 1994 and again in 1998. The 2004 amendments to the AT Act of 1998 resulted in significant changes uh, to the state AT programs. The 2004 statute required mandatory formula state grant and territory programs and moved the AT Act from NIDR to RSA, the Rehabilitation Services Administration within the Department of Education. The AT Act of 2004 also required the statewide AT program to conduct a set of state level and state leadership activities. Fast forward a decade later when in 2014 Congress reauthorized WIA and the new Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act, WIOA, transferred the administration of the AT Act from Ed RSA to HHS ACL in the Center for Integrated Programs, CIP. Both the Lifespan Respite Program and the AT Act Program are housed in ACL's Office of Consumer Access and Self-Determination within CIP. Both programs are critically important person-centered components of long-term services and supports. Both assist individuals across the lifespan to remain in their homes and communities, as well as relieve burden on family caregivers. The mission of the AT Act programs is to serve people who have a functional need of all ages from cradle to rocking chair. The overall, or, or should I say even overarching goal is to get assistive technology devices and durable medical equipment into the hands of those who need it. So who are the AT Act programs? There are 56 state and territory statewide AT programs. The governor designates a lead agency, and if appropriate, an implementing entity. So for those lead agencies, there are 27 state vocational rehabilitation agencies that act as the lead, designated by the governor of their state. I should also note that the mayor in DC designates their program. There are also 20 universities that are designated as a lead agency. Of those 15 are USED which are university centers for excellence in developmental disabilities, education, research, and service. There are nine additional state agencies that act as lead agencies. 
they fall in the realm of disability, administrative, and special education. A little bit about the implementing unit, which can be either a lead agency or implementing entity. 14 nonprofit agencies act as an implement, implementing agency. Um, seven are dedicated AT agencies. There's also two protection and advocacy agencies that serve as an implementing entity, two independent living entities, two Easter Seals, and one additional uh, entity. 20 higher education uh, entities serve in that implementing role, and 22 state agencies, 14 of which are VR. There are eight others that fall in the categories within disability administration, education, health, and, and, and also DD Council. So I'd like to turn it over to Marty Exline, whom you heard is the uh, AT3 director for the next part of this opening uh, presentation. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Rob. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to touch on um, the, the AT Act really has made a huge difference for states in terms of what they're able to do. Um, you know, looking at, and Rob's going to go over some of the, the access and acquisition um, uh, programs or activities in a second, but the, for instance, the device loan programs have made a huge difference in states for borrowers to be able to avoid making uh, purchasing decisions um, about getting AT that really doesn't meet their needs better than some other piece of AT might, or or to borrow a device when their AT device, regardless of what it is, is in for repair, as opposed to having to go out or to rent or or lease a piece of equipment. Um, same with demonstrations. Just the opportunity to to try before you buy has made a a big difference for people um, in terms of selecting the right AT. And then other programs, the, uh, in terms of going, looking at some of the acquisition programs, the uh, durable medical equipment utilization to obtain AT at a very low cost or no cost in most cases. And then there's uh, state financing programs that include um, both financial loan programs to help people get the AT their need, that they need, and there's other funding assistance programs depending on the state that states have been able to um, to leverage funding from other um, federal, state, or local governments or private sources to add additional services, um, um, additional ways of people getting the AT they need. Um, so it, it really has made a huge difference and I think has, has uh, shown a, a major return on investment for the, for the uh, federal funds that make the program possible. And Rob, could you go ahead and, and go over some of the, uh, the acquisition and access activities? Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, Marty. I definitely want to emphasize the Section 4 activities that are required uh, for the state AT programs to conduct. And so there's a set of um, state leadership activities that, that are all required of the AT programs, and that involves uh, – training and technical assistance, uh, public awareness, including information and assistance, coordination and collaboration. And so the states spend less money on these activities because the majority of the funds are spent on what are referred to as the state level activities. And so Marty went over some of those activities. And if you look at how they're broken down, you have access activities as well as acquisition. And so clearly within the access activities, you know, it's really important for an individual to compare features and benefits of an AT device or durable medical equipment and determine if that device is appropriate for that person. And so a, per, a person can go into an AT program, have devices demonstrated to them uh, by a certified assistive technology specialist, and then perhaps even beyond that, take home a device for up to six weeks in what Marty was saying, try before you buy. And, and quite honestly, if the individual determines that the device does not work well for them, that of course is a positive because you are reducing uh, fraud, waste, and abuse. We really want individuals to acquire or at least have access to devices that, that work for them. 
And so just looking at some of the data here from FY 2017, you know, over 80,000 individuals across the country were able to participate in device demonstrations from their AT program within their state. And north of 50,000 devices were borrowed on a short-term basis through the, through the device loan program. And you know, the device loan program is great for decision making. Uh, individuals can borrow a device while a device is being repaired, while they're waiting for funding. It could also be a short-term uh, accommodation or maybe even for pro professional development or an education goal. And so this is all really cool because the natural succession of these activities is for an individual to think about acquiring a device. And if you look at some of the numbers here, you have individuals who are able to acquire close to, in value, $30 million by obtaining a lightly used device. Um, and sometimes these devices um, are free, sometimes it, it, they are at minimal cost. And for the device realization activities, those can be device exchange, refurbished device, reassigned device, or an open-ended loan device. Of course, after the, the device is sanitized and working so that it is, that is like, like new because it's a gently used device. And so it's really exciting to see that many individuals acquired close to 75,000 devices that re resulted in a great saving to, to, to those individuals. In addition to that, there are state financing activities that the AT programs conduct, and these can be uh, alternative financing loan programs that provide cash loans for individuals to purchase devices um, at lower interest rates and over extended terms. It's a great way of uh, building credit for individuals especially those who have not established credit before. And there are other activities that a state can provide to assist individuals to acquire uh, AT devices that will help them uh, be successful in their, in their goals. And so just want to emphasize the four core uh, state-level activities and provide a little bit of background. And I'm going to turn it back over to Marty Exline. Yeah, and we have a couple of, of polling questions that are up. So uh, there you go. So if you just take a second to, to answer those questions, have you ever been in contact with your state or territory AT program? And then the second one, have you ever made a referral? So it looks like a pretty good mix of between um, some of you that have and, and those of you that haven't. And that's the same way with, with referrals. Great. Well, that's good. Uh, one of the things we wanted to make sure was uh, that you have the ability, if you if you wanted to, to know who your state AT program was and who to contact if you have questions. So, and I have this uh, listed, this link listed on uh, at the end in the resources. But uh, definitely, um, if you look at the AT3 Center's website, um, there's a directory on that link, and you can look at um, you can look at a variety of things. If you just want to find out um, information about the AT program in your state, then you can look it up by your state. You can um, see who the director is. You can find out what the website is, um, what the telephone and email contact person is. And the other thing that you can do is you can look up specifically, um, like in Missouri, if I wanted to look up who is responsible for the, the device loan program, and I wanted to send them an email. It also has the email addresses for each state for the person responsible for an activity. So you can look at, um, when you look at your state, you'll see who the, who the email address is for the individual who's responsible for the device loan program or device demonstration program or, or reuse or financial loan 
or if there's some other type of funding program, um, other financial, other state, uh, state uh, financing, it'll have um, the email address for that person too. So again, I have, I have these, uh, the email address or the website list at the end too, but I want to make sure that everybody was aware of that. So if you haven't been in contact and want to find out if there's um, some service that might benefit you or some of the people you work with, then you'll be able to do that. And then I wanted to start to, to get into some of our presenters. Um, this webinar is really a great opportunity to, to um, further collaboration between the Lifespan Respite Programs and the Assistive Technology Programs. Um, there's a lot in common, obviously. Certain both require a, a person-centered approach. Um, each person is different. Situations are different. And one type of AT is going to fulfill everybody's needs um, depending on, on the person, on actually on the caregivers, on um, the situation that they're in. And uh, so there have been some incredible partnerships um, developed between the state AT programs and the lifespan respite programs. And we'll be hearing about uh, some of those today, um, looking at some of those connections. Um, first, it's going to be uh, Chris Kramer from the Idaho AT Project. And she's going to both talk about uh, how the Idaho program has been involved with lifespan respite, but also explore some AT devices. And then after that, Stacy Driscoll from New Hampshire is going to talk about the New Hampshire AT's program's collaboration with um, their state's No Wrong Door program which is a collaboration that's kind of taken place in many states. And then, of course, Cheryl Smith from the Life, Alabama Lifespan Respite Program is going to talk about a project they have um, with an AT toolkit working with the uh, Alabama AT program. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Krista. OK, can you hear me? We can. Yes. OK, good. <laughs> See if I can get all my buttons working here. Anyway, um, as Marty said, I'm Krista Kramer, and I've been with the Idaho Assistive Technology Project for about a year and a half after spending 23 years working for an independent living center. All right, that button, that button, there we go. Um, the Idaho Assistive Technology Project has been doing a variety of caregiver networking connections. We were participants in the development of the State Lifespan Respite Coalition. We're members of the Idaho Caregiver Alliance. As a matter of fact, I've got their call immediately after this. Um, we are written into the state plans for the area agencies on aging and the state independent living council and we have representatives from the idaho commission on aging and the triple a's on our assistive technology advisory board we do a variety of training and outreach um, related to assistive technology uh, I've been doing trainings for the Area Agency on Aging staff, um, including their ombudsman program folks who are those people in all of our facilities. Um, we've been, do and that training is becoming a train the trainer project. So now their staff are taking that out to their local communities. We've been doing training with home care providers, health care providers, medical providers, um, doing outreach through senior and community health fairs, and we're also um, putting information about assistive technology out through social media and newsletters of all of our aging and independent living um, resource materials. I'm going to spend most of my time focusing on technology, but it really isn't about the technology. 
It's about the impact that these devices can have on people's lives. And I want to start with personal emergency response systems. They used to be landline-based and only good near your landline phone. But now these personal emergency response systems, there are ones that are cell phone-based, wearables, single button systems, or a single button press on a, a cell phone that's designed for seniors or people with disabilities. Some of these response systems have GPS built in. So even if the person can't tell you where they are, they can be located by the service provider. And others have automatic fall detection built in so that if the individual can't press the button and say, I need help, if a fall is detected, um, someone who's monitoring that system will automatically come on and check to see if they're OK. There are also apps such as, well, apps that include GPS monitoring and can send a message to a caregiver when the individual arrives at their destination. Digital assistants are an upcoming technology in this field. Amazon Echo, Google Home, and all of those sorts of products. I want to tell you a story. Um, back in March, I had a contact from a friend who uses a power wheelchair about getting stuck in her refrigerator when her power chair died. Um, her cell phone was still on the charger in the bedroom, and she, she was so frustrated. She says, I always have my cell phone with me, but she didn't that morning. And neither her service dog nor her setting off her car alarm brought anyone to help. And she finally realized that there was an Amazon Echo in her living room. And so she started calling, Alexa, <laughs> you know, call so-and-so going through her list of neighbors until she finally reached someone who could hear something like stock and the dog barking and then saw the phone number and came and rescued her, her from her refrigerator. And the very first person I shared that story with got all teary-eyed and told me that her mother spent 26 hours stranded in a Hoyer lift when her husband, primary caregiver, dropped dead while she was being transferred into the shower. And then this woman spent six weeks in the hospital recovering from the hematoma from being unable to move for that 26 hours. Alexa might not have been able to save her husband, but being able to call for help would have prevented the cost of that six-week hospital stay. And just that one six-week hospital stay could have provided a significant equipment distribution program for these devices. Um, I also wanted to let you know that the Echo Connect now will allow you to connect your landline phone to a device that um, will allow you to make and answer telephone calls by voice, eliminating the need to dial the phone. Alerting systems. All right, my notes are no longer progressing here. There we go. Um, Every time I do a presentation for seniors or caregivers, I ask the question, would you hear the smoke detector when your hearing aids are out at night? The question's really for everyone, but um, it's something to make sure that people are considering on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm sure Many of you are familiar with alerting systems that will flash lights or vibrate your bed 
when the alarm clock or doorbell or telephone ring. Um, and a number of these alerting systems also have an option for connecting in a smoke detector one way or another. And in case you haven't seen them, some of these systems also now allow you to connect to a cell phone rather than a landline. I purchased one of these systems for my grandfather when he was primary caregiver for my grandmother who had lost a leg to diabetes. She slept in a recliner in the living room, and he heard nothing when his hearing aids were out at night. Um, he wasn't sleeping well because he was afraid she would need help or get, try to get up on her own and fall, and he wouldn't hear her. So I set up the doorbell button next to her chair, and when she needed to get up, all she had to do was to press the doorbell to set off a vibrator under his pillow and flash a lamp in his room. He slept better. She took fewer risks trying to get up without assistance, and it was a big win for both of them. I worked with another couple with a similar situation, um, and the night before I arrived to share information about it with them, the woman was literally throwing things across their bedroom trying to wake up her husband to get help to get to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Um, there are also apps for smartphones that are noise sensors. There is one called Sound Alert that listens for environmental noises like smoke alarms. And you can customize it to listen for your doorbell and telephone ring and microwave beep. Um, and they can also be connected to items like an Apple or Pebble watch that will vibrate on your wrist to let you know when these sounds are identified. Um, other apps will use the camera on your phone as a motion detector to alert you to movements in a room. Monitors are another yeah. monitors are another tool that can give caregivers rest and the reassurance that they aren't missing something when they're needed. These can range from a motion detector like the one in the lower left um, that alerts a caregiver when someone's feet touch the floor or when someone goes through a doorway, to GPS trackers that will let let you pinpoint someone's location on an app on your smartphone or get an alert when someone goes outside their usual parameters. Um, the picture in the middle is a video monitor, and I worked with a deaf mom to get one of these systems set up so she could keep an eye on her two toddlers and know what they were up to at any time and get a vibration alert on the monitor whenever there were um, sounds like her baby started crying. Environmental control units. You can now control your thermostat, lights, entertainment system, appliances, almost anything from your smartphone. And if you don't have a smartphone, there are inexpensive remote controls for outlets. Um, you plug in a unit that looks like the outlet box in the lower um, left-hand corner, and anything you plug into that, you have a remote on and off switch control for it. I had a neighbor who was alone in bed all night um, after the caregiver left until someone came in the morning. And he also had insomnia. And he would wake up and stew in the dark until we got him a set of these outlet switches. For under 30 bucks, he could control his lamp, radio, TV, heater, and fan which made a huge difference in the quality of his nights. You can also get remote 
um, control door locks and openers or smart locks that will automatically unlock when the pro proximity sensor detects a key, eliminating the need to be able to get a real key into a lock and turn it. The second picture on the right is a remote control for a door opener designed for interior doors, and the controller is mounted on this individual's walker. Mobility. Since falls are one of the biggest reasons people end up in care facilities, it's worth thinking about assistive technology to reduce falls. From grab bars and lift recliners to patient lifts and seats that will boost you up or lift you in, there are a whole variety of tools to help with mobility. So many people still use the term confined to a wheelchair, but a wheelchair can be a freedom tool to get you where you want to go when your knees or your stamina won't get you there. A standing pole can be placed anywhere extra support is needed, as long as there's enough support on the ceiling and it's not 20 feet tall. Um, there are portable booster devices like this booster commode or a portable one that you can just put on any chair that have a hydraulic lift system to give you an extra help getting into standing. And they also reduce that sense of, I'm sitting, I'm sitting, I'm falling, boof. Um, these portable easy lift systems are really helpful. They can also broaden the range of possible caregivers by reducing the need for lifting so that, you know, the 90-pound wife can be um, the primary caregiver for a longer period of time for um, some, a, a larger spouse who can't um, stand easily. And you can even modify your vehicle to turn someone um, in, let them sit down, and then um, lift and turn them into a seated position in the car, or a lift to pick up their scooter and put it into the trunk. Transfer devices. Um, from my viewpoint, these are one of the most underutilized tools for caregivers. The device on the right is an easy pivot transfer device, and it's got a platform for the person's feet, knee pads, and a strap to stabilize them. And then the individual leans over a chest pad. A strap goes under their thighs, and the caregiver then just tips them forward using the levers, rolls them to their destination. You can pull down pants if needed, and then set the person back down again, all without lifting. The device on the left is well designed for transfers into a car. A Hoyer lift can be used um, to pick someone up even if they've fallen onto the floor. Overhead track systems and stair glides can also help keep someone in their own home at roughly the cost of a month or maybe two in a nursing home. Hearing assistance. Telephone communication is a basic tool that many depend on for support of all kinds. Many people with a hearing impairment use a speakerphone because getting the sound in both ears rather than just one improves their speech discrimination. Caption phone services can be used to provide real-time captioning of phone calls to allow them to read what they can't otherwise decipher by just listening. The device in the middle is a pocket talker the equivalent of an old body-worn hearing aid. And for about $120 to $180, you can get a microphone amplifier with your own volume and pitch control 
and pretty good sound quality. Hearing aid apps and headphones can allow you to use your smartphone to do the same thing and adjust it to your own hearing profile. Um, there's also been a recent explosion in ways to get sound from your favorite sound sources, TV, cell phone, music device, or from a microphone directly into your ears or hearing aids via transmitters or Bluetooth devices. You can even get bone conduction headphones or streamers that will take a sound, um, sound source and connect it directly into your hearing aids. Give that person with a hearing impairment their own volume control so that the family can stand to be in the same room. Um, that's always appreciated by the caregivers. Um, another of the options for hearing assistance is speech-to-text options that can provide real-time captioning for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. And the app that's shown in the picture on the right is actually one that will allow individuals in a conference um, or meeting situation to use their own smart devices as a remote microphone to convert what they're saying into a message that's identified for a hard of hearing participant in the group. Accessible computing is another of those realms that can open up the world to someone who is place-bound. And there are so many ways of accessing those devices now. Voice control, head control, chin control, eye gaze, foot control, switch control. Um, the picture on top is um, Todd Stabelfeld, also known as the quad father. He um, uses a joystick and switch array to control his power wheelchair, his iPhone, and runs his business with that device. The picture on, uh, uh, below his is a picture of a glass house head mouse, which basically allows someone to control the cursor on their computer by moving their nose or where they're looking on the screen, and then bite on um, a little switch in order to do the mouse clicks. And then there's the assistive technology Swiss Army knife, our smart devices. Um, you've probably heard that phrase, there's an app for that. Well, there probably is. There are apps now for to turn your smartphone into hearing amplification, a magnifier. They can do image recognition, you know, pull that can off the shelf and point your uh, phone at it, at the uh, bar, barcode, and have it tell you that's a can of Campbell's mushroom soup, not a can of pork and beans or mushy peas. Um, there are apps for readers. Um, you can get books on tape via your smartphone. You can get navigation assistance that will tell you not only step-by-step -step directions, but what business you're passing and maybe even their special of the day. There are apps that will give you reminders when, when it's time to take your medication. And you can even connect that into um, your Amazon Echo or Google Home device and have a voice come on at 10 o'clock and say, it's time to take your medications now. You can set up step-by-step -step directions for, you know, the tasks that need to be accomplished before the person leaves the house in the morning or step-by-step -step directions how to turn on and access their email. You can get captioned calls on a smart device. 
so you don't need the specialized phone. Um, you can use it as an augmentative, augmentative communication device or speech output. And I'm guessing that nearly everyone on this call already has a smart device in their pocket. Um, you just need to download the, load the apps or turn on the accessibility features, and these are at the fingertips of you and um, the people you're providing care to. This, oh, sorry, forgot to forward that slide. Anyway, um, this has been just the tip of the iceberg of the possibilities that assistive technology can provide. So when caregivers are encountering any kind of barrier, please check in with your AT projects or the Centers for Independent Living for your area about the tools that might be available to help. Here's my contact information. Um, and if there are questions, um, this would be a time to address a few of those. Uh, we, we did have a couple of questions come in, Krista. Um, the first one is from Vicki uh, Perez, and she wants to know how do you respond to concerns regarding HIPAA and information security when it comes to the Echo and Google Home products? <laughs> um, If an individual is using that as their, um, their phone system, yes, there are concerns right now about those systems being hacked into, just like there are concerns about our bank accounts being hacked into. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question about HIPAA concerns with them. Well, maybe we could get our um, questioner to clarify, or um, we can set you up for emailing afterwards. Um, okay. We are running a little short on time, and I do have another question here. Um, it's actually two questions in one. Um, Melissa Mullins asks, are the technology devices required to be prescribed by a doctor? Uh, specifically technology for nonverbal uh, individuals on the autism uh, spectrum, and are insurance companies covering these devices? Speech generating devices, um, there often is either insurance coverage or they're also included under Medicaid and Medicare coverage. Um, and those, yes, there would need to be a doctor prescription or referral to a speech therapist who would do the evaluation and help them get an appropriate device. Um, the a state AT projects often have a spectrum of those devices in their lending libraries available for trial and may or may not have a speech and language pathologist qualified to do that prescription process, depending on the state. A lot of the devices that I mentioned, there is no insurance coverage for because they're not considered medically necessary. And so that's a place where you want to get in touch with, also with your state AT projects about what are the other possible resources for finding funding for those devices. Great, thank you. Very helpful. Let's uh, move on to our next speaker, Stacy. Thank you very much. So, oh, I hit it twice. There we go. Um, my name is Stacy Driscoll, and I am the AT Specialist with Assistive Technology in New Hampshire. And we have been coordinating with our Aging and Disability Rights Center as part of the, I'm going to skip over this, as, as part of the No Wrong Door 
system, they were granted one of the No Wrong Door System grants. And so we've been collaborating with them. We started this in July of 2016. And we've got this going pretty smoothly of what of providing them with some devices and some support some training. And so I'm just going to kind of go through what it is that we did to get this established and then talk about some of the devices. Krista did a great job of talking about the wide range of devices that are available. So we have 16 offices. There are service link offices within the state. And so we collaborated with those offices. Each office has a center manager. And so I worked fairly closely with those center managers in order to uh, establish this partnership. So we looked, we first met, determined what we were going to do decided on devices and purchased those devices in September of 2016. Those were decided through the State AT Act program, so through at and We picked those devices. There are other states that have done similar, and they have surveyed their ADRC in order to determine what devices people may be interested in. So we did a lot of legwork getting this going. And then we did a Zoom meeting, so a, a video conference with the center managers, and talked about how we were going to kick this off. We held two trainings, and then implementation began in April of 2017. We meet monthly via the Zoom conferencing in order to ask questions, review data, go through um, things like that. So before the implementation, we purchased 15 sets of 30 devices. So there are 13 offices that gave us two extra sets so that when I'm on the road doing demonstrations, um, it, there's two sets that at &H has, plus we can replace items as necessary. So we took pictures of everything, and we used an app called Fonto in order to label all of those pictures. You're going to see in these coming slides what that actually, how that looked. And we had work study students help with this. So there wasn't a whole lot of cost to us for us because we were able to have the work study students. We labeled everything as belonging to at &H, So if they're not using it, it would be able to come back to us. We also created short videos. So uh, one of the work study students videoed me explaining each of the devices, what limitations they would be helpful for, how to use them. And those are used for internal training, for refreshers to be shared with consumers. So let's say they did a device for, uh, did a demonstration for somebody, and that person said, oh, yeah, that really, I, I'd like to have a loan for that. I'd like to take it for two weeks. Well, they get it home. These videos they could share with those consumers who would then be able to re-watch the video and say, oh, yeah, that's what they were talking about. Here, let me be able to try this out. We also created QR codes to go with each of the videos. So if they had a smartphone, they could just easily click on the QR code and it would bring them right to each of the videos. So what we did find, I'm just going to kind of jump ahead a little bit with these videos, is they're on YouTube. The Each of the offices, they have a sheet with all of the links. What they were finding in some of the more excuse me, rural areas of New Hampshire, they would be somewhere, they would be trying to get the link, and it would not work for them. So we ended up downloading all of the videos onto either um, a USB drive or some offices had an iPad. So I downloaded, just airdropped them right to their iPad. And so now they have them on the device so that they can share them easily when they're out and about. So that was something that we changed along the way. And this was certainly, we were very open to how can we help you and what are some tweaks to this that we need to do. And so that was one that really um, became evident that they really wanted to be able to share these videos. So the videos, we kind of looked at them as internal use at first. Um, they've been shared on Facebook. I've I've scrolled through Facebook and seen one video, see myself. and. So uh, they're definitely out there. And I'm going to be sharing a couple of the videos with you. Uh, most of them are 30 seconds to a minute. A few are a little bit longer than that. 
we created a resource finder, and then also once we started up with everyone, they had an internal online system that they used. So I was able to upload all of the resources there so that they had hard copies and had them available on their online system as well. So within that resource binder were the procedure documents of roles and responsibilities. We had agreed to all of this prior to implementation. Device reference sheets, as I'm going to show you. The data collection forms. So Rob was talking about providing demonstrations and loans and all of those different numbers. Well, he was able to have those numbers because each of the states collect the data and then we all share that. And so we are asking for the ServiceLink offices to collect the data on the demonstrations and the loans that they provide. And so they fill out those data forms and then we enter the data into our system. And then a battery inventory, they're responsible for batteries a price list. Each kit was approximately $800 worth of devices. Pocket Talker was most expensive. Krista talked about that a little bit earlier. So it's about $130 for a Pocket Talker. And some of them were probably some $5 items, you know, that, that low as well. And then we they had the device, the YouTube clip document that was also in there. Having it also be online, I've added some videos along the way, and I've been able to just keep that document um, updated for them so that it's most current. So this is our device reference sheet. So you can see where I said we took pictures, and then using the app, we were able to write right on each of the pictures of what each of the items is. We categorize them according to our data collection system. This is a two-sided, sorry. Oops, I don't know what that just did. I don't know if someone else is tapping on this. I'm going to, my hand is not on it. OK, hopefully it'll stay. So um, this is a two-sided sheet. So it also has, you can see where it has the QR code, has the name of the item, and then also has a link. So if somebody didn't want to have the, go to the QR code, they could actually go right to a link that would bring them to both to the video and then also where to get the item. We were very clear on this is not the only place to get this item, but we just want to give you uh, some idea of where you might start for looking for the item. And then we did a hands-on training. So once we had all of the items and had all of the materials together, we did a hands-on training with everybody. We began with scenarios to quote unquote, test their knowledge. So one of the questions that consumer is having difficulty getting in and out of the car, what device would you suggest she try out? The answer is the handy bar. I'm going to show you a little video of the handy bar later if you're not familiar with that. And so just to give people an idea of when they might show particular items. And so in doing this, it was interesting. We started and people were like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. We hadn't gone through the items in the kit yet, and then some of the groups decided, oh, let me start looking in uh, in this crate and going through what the items are, and then they tried to kind of match, oh, this looks like something that would, would work here. So that was a good kind of starting out getting people thinking. So then we reviewed policies and procedures. Center managers had all approved that ahead of time. And then we went one by one through each of the devices, and Everyone was able to touch that device, try it out, use it, um, really get comfortable with the device. I didn't go through each video and have them watch it. It was a hands-on training. But they did have that in order to go back so that they could refresh themselves. There was also follow-up training on hearing assistive technology because some of those devices had been already distributed to the service links. And then we went over training on how to fill out the data collection forms. This had been an ongoing process. Um, we're, we're always going back to this. At this point, everyone's pretty clear on how to fill those out, but that did take a while. And we did have different forms so that people could choose what was the easiest form. For them, there's also been talk of that becoming part of their referral system so that when they are in the computer and already working with this person, the eight, you know, did you show them AT, yes or no, and then yes, and the questions come up. So that is a work in progress. We're not there yet, but that has been discussed as well. So it, we're certainly not at, here's this perfectly well 
oiled machine, but we've really worked together and have some really great things happening, and we're always trying to tweak that and improve it. Also, after the fact, when everyone got all of the devices, they said, you know, we really, we suggested to all of the offices, if you can, put this all out for people to see, that would be really helpful. So then people are going to ask questions and say, you know, hey, what's this? And, you know, can I try this out? And making it not just in a back closet somewhere that people forget about it. And so we did create these posters. They're two feet by three feet, I think. And they were all printed. Each office has them uh, posted so that individuals can see that. What also happened about six months ago, um, there was discussion of, OK, we have this great poster, but each office could we create a poster so kind of when you're sitting in the doctor's office and you're waiting for the doctor to come in and you're reading all about immunizations and things like that, could we create just an 8.5 by 11 poster that talks about assistive technology? And so we did create um, a poster for that um, due to an error on my part that didn't end up as part of this slide, these slides. So just to give you an idea, we did it via questions. So it says, do you have difficulty reading your medication bottle? And it shows a device for um, magnification. Do you or someone you live with have difficulty hearing the TV or the doorbell? And it shows a picture of the pocket talker. Have you stopped preparing meals that you once enjoyed preparing? And it shows a picture of the rocker tea knife. And then it says, there are many other solutions. These and many other solutions are available for demonstration. Ask your options counselor today. So those just a very quick, easy to read while you're sitting there, possibly waiting for the option counselor. You're going to be talking about Medicaid or something else unrelated, but it could really get uh, individuals to ask about those items. This is just one of the setups in the office. They have the poster on the door, and then they actually have bookshelves showing all of the devices out there. One of the offices, this is actually our most north, most rural office, she actually purchased a one of those frames that you can put pictures in, and the pictures just rotate through. So it's a digital photo frame. And so she has all of the pictures of the devices, and they just scroll through. So if someone's sitting in the waiting area, that is going through all of the pictures, which we thought was a really great idea. Um, so right now, we do the Zoom conference calls uh, once a month. The kits are set. They, they're in rolling carts, so they can take them on the road. As you see, some have it set up for people to see. We want these of what they're already doing, not to add one more thing. That's a really great thought, but the reality is it does add one more thing for them to do, but it lends itself um, in a lot of ways for people to just say, OK, this person's really struggling here. Have you heard about this? Are you interested? Let me show you this particular office, uh, this particular item. A lot of the offices use the pocket talker when consumers are with them, and they may be uh, hearing impaired. And so they are able to use that with the individuals while they're working with them. So that is really helpful as well. And they report. Some people have been doing some awareness events, which is great. They have all of those devices there, um, hoping to generate more referrals by using those. There's also high staff turnover. And so with the high staff turnover, having those videos has been very helpful. But it's also getting people up to speed in order to be able to uh, do those demonstrations. And so we're going to show a couple quick little videos before we go to the polling questions. So can we do the video of the pocket talker? You know what? OK, let's do that one first, and then I'll pick, we'll do the handy bar after. This is the Pocket Talker Pro. It has an external mic. And today we are using it with the behind the ear headset. This is a great headset because it rests on the ears of the individual and wraps around the head. And so it, it cups the ear, minimizing feedback. And it doesn't flip off the person's head as easily as this headset here. 
most of the time we will see this headset uh, when people buy an assistive listening device, but they have an option to get the behind the ear headset. The Pocket Talker Pro has a volume control only. When you turn it on, the light turns green. A person can use this for one-on-one -on -one conversations. They can uh, use it in the car, in the dining area. People need to keep in mind that the best audio input is when the microphone is near the speaker. If people choose to listen to a person at a distance, they may use the volume at such a high level that if someone near them speaks, then it may be too loud, loud and painful. Okay, and in the interest of time, let's just go for the video for the handy bar. I also have a video of the NORC, but um, in the interest of time, let's just do the handy bar. So this is the handy bar, and so it is used for, in real life, if you your car goes in the water, you can smash the window, you can cut your seatbelt, there's a little blade here. But what we're using it for, and many people use it for, is to help them get out of the car, give them a little bit of a boost. So you can see right here that there's this little hook. And so I can put my handy bar right in here. And so this stays pretty stable. This is the handy bar, and so it is used for, in real life, if you your car goes in the water, you can smash the window, you can cut your seat belt, there's a little blade here. But what we're using it for, and many people use it for, is to help them get out of the car, give them a little bit of a boost. So you can see right here that there's this little hook. And so I can put my handy bar right in here. And so this stays pretty stable and then I can use my hand, and this works on either the driver's side or the passenger side. So when I get myself situated, that I'm now out of the car and I need that little boost to get up, I can now hold on to my door, have this on my left side, and I can push myself right up and out of the car. Once people see the handy bar, they're just really intrigued with with that, um, it is available. You can get it at Walmart. You can find them on Amazon. And I know a lot of people just, a lot of the presentations I do are just very impressed with the handy bar. I've had people say that they themselves don't need the handy bar, but they do use it. They do keep it in their car because they maybe are a caregiver for someone else or use it to, when they transport friends from here to there, uh, and so that's been a really positive on that one. Okay. So are we going to go to the polling question and then on to Cheryl? Yep, that's the plan, yep. Okay. <clears throat> and it looks like a split, but looks like there's more people who weren't aware of the kinds of devices in the device loan programs or what's available through the reuse programs as the ones who were. But with that, why don't we go ahead and move on to you, Cheryl? Okay. Well, um, thank you. At this point, I think the respite providers and programs on the call might be wondering, how can I facilitate linking caregivers and care recipients to these AT tools and resources similar to those that were shared today? So we wanted to share a project in Alabama that uh, others might want to replicate in their community. Uh, just to share a little background, UCP of Huntsville is fortunate to not only be a training partner for the state's Tech Act program, called STAR, but also a partner with Alabama's Lifespan Respite Grant. Through our work on both projects, we realized the benefits of sharing information and resources about assistive technology 
not only to individuals with disabilities, chronic health, or aging conditions, but also to caregivers across the lifespan. So for this reason, we created a new project in 2016, Helping Those Who Care, to introduce caregivers to simple assistive technology solutions. Let me advance the slide. Um, the project uh, not only uh, introduces them to, hopefully, uh, solutions to promote the care recipient independence, allow care recipients to age in place longer in their own home, and to provide an enhanced quality of life for both the caregiver and the care recipient. An additional goal was to reduce caregiver stress and fatigue, both of which can impact the need for respite. So the uh, way the project works, um, it was originally funded um, by the Alabama Council on Developmental Disabilities through a grant for families affected by disability. But it was later expanded to address the needs of the aging community through funding from the Department of Senior Services and the Top of Alabama Regional Council on Governments. And while the project ends this September 30, um, we will continue as Alabama Lifespan Respite to offer helping those who care um, information and trainings through the uh, ACL Federal Lifespan Respite Grant as one of the program's statewide caregiver education trainings. So the way the training works uh, to encourage attendees to attend, um, participants to attend, and to reduce the barriers of attendance, we do offer a respite assistance stipend um, so they can arrange care for their loved one. Uh, we provide, similarly, a, an assistive technology item to those that participate in the training. We also um, get, offer access to our lending library of assistive technology items. And we go through the, in the training, and I'll share that in just a minute, what all we offer and share with them. But we do, uh, as one of the benefits, offer direct access to letting individuals that participate demonstrate or um, have a demonstration or actually borrow the items prior to purchasing so they can make sure that that is an item that would benefit their family. Um, we give them caregiver resources, and um, we also offer post-training technical assistance. So uh, when participants um, go through the training, we will give them print materials on all of the STAR program uh, offered in Alabama. That is the training, demonstration and loan, alternative finance for larger IT needs, and the reutilization um, program for free assistive technology items. Um, the trainer usually highlights the reuse center closest to the audience so they can establish a relationship with the AT center closest to them. Um, we provide detailed print instructions on how to use our real-time AV inventory site. Uh, we are part of a larger number of states who um, have the platform atforall.com. Of course, we are al at atforall.com to um, access the Alabama inventory. Uh, we provide a PIN uh, for two reasons. One, it has the contact information, but uh, also to help them in completing surveys at the end of the training to see if the training was worthwhile to their family. Um, the program does feature hands-on demonstration of at least 20 items uh, from the demo and loan program inventory. We also give a handout, an example of what types of items are being demonstrated. We give them, um, we usually demonstrate uh, some of the higher tech items that were already discussed today, um, but we do really focus on a lot of the lower technology items um, in keeping with our audience. Um, after the training, we will do technical assistance um, via call or email, uh, whatever their uh, preference. And we want to see if the training, um, if the participants actually utilize their free AT item, if they need additional AT information, if they um, need help creating an account on that AT for All site, if they'd like to borrow any other additional items, or if there's any other way we can assist the family. Um, additionally, uh, we um, have learned through this process that we have um, unique audiences that have requested additional training 
So we have AT for Parkinson's, AT for Alzheimer's, AT for autism, and we, we can actually customize the training for um, very uh, targeted groups. We um, do try to share a lot of information and resources. We do have that um, on not only our STAR training website, a link to this, uh, but also on our Alabama Respite website. Um, so many families are accessing things via the Internet now, mostly loved ones. Um, so we do have a new toolkit available online. Um, it is also going to be in print form in English and Spanish. The um, site is, uh, what's wonderful about the site is every item on the, that is featured directly links to items in our demo and loan program. So here is a sample of what the toolkit looks like electronically. Across the top, you have different categories that will help narrow your search. Uh, we do help um, share information about um, what is assistive technology. We define what respite is and why AT can be of benefit to caregivers and care recipients. Um, we do have to the far lower right quadrant information on additional links that we share just to, um, because we cannot share every item that we know about in assistive technology and we do try to narrow in on those items that are lower cost, um, easier to understand. Um, we, you know, try to also link it to those in the inventory. Um, but we also have other um, startraining.org websites and other AT sites and resources that we want them to have access to. Of interest is our Pinterest board. We do have a lot of um, comments on um, items that are suggestions uh, that we don't have in our inventory, but we want our caregivers to know about them. So we have a Pinterest board demonstrating a lot of different ideas that um, our caregivers might be able to use and benefit even if they purchase it off the shelf in their local store. So um, mainly we wanted to share this project in hopes that other Lifespan Respite programs will create a similar training and a resource tool, whether it's online or in print form and hopefully that will benefit the caregivers and care recipients in their states and help link between programs. We were blessed because we worked on both projects, but I think um, it's important to link to your AT site and to uh, anything that we can do in the respite provider world to make that um, an easier transition and better understandable to our audiences. Um, we want to encourage that. So we hope other lifespan respite states will take an opportunity to do something similar so we can um, improve the quality of life for both and, of course, reduce the caregiver stress and fatigue um, that often uh, impacts the need for respite. I don't know if there's any questions. I tried to rush uh, in the interest of time. Thank you, Cheryl. And this is Marty. I'm just going to go through a couple of things real quick to see if, if anybody does have any questions. Um, and basically, just to uh, get the point across that everybody else has been talking about, there are a lot of great collaborations and partnerships with the different caregiver coalitions and state uh, respite care programs and the state AT program, um, ranging from trainings to AT kits of demonstration items that um, are shared with maybe the area agencies on aging or the aging and disability resource centers, um, inclusion of information in uh, caregiver guides, collaborations with programs like Money Follows a Person to help people transition out of uh, institutional care, and then a, a number of states that have collaborations with their No Wrong Door program. And this is just, um, this is an example of, uh, this is Missouri's uh, uh, page for their equipment loan program. In most states, you'll find um, an inventory page uh, along these lines or something um, from AT, AT for All or something that looks like this. So you can kind of search by type of device and find out if they have something in their program that you might want to borrow to see what they need. 
And then basically, um, we, I just put together some, some resources. Uh, the first one to find your state AT program, uh, some ATF AQs, and just different sites to emphasize uh, assistive technology for caregivers. And then uh, there is a last one is uh, the Assistive Technology Industry Association has an AT funding guide that folks might be interested in. But I'm just going to let it go there and uh, see if there's any other questions that anybody has. I do see one, prog one question here from Ellie Billman. Um, and she wants to know, do loan programs often have term limits on how long the item can be borrowed? And what does the liability look like if an individual is injured using a loan device? Well, this is Marty. Um, it varies from state to state, but generally I'd say um, ranging from four to six weeks for some need to try out a device, but again, it does vary from state to state. Um, we've never had anybody, I don't know of anybody that was ever injured by an AT device. So as, as far as I know, um, as far as I know, that hasn't come up. Any other questions? I'll give people another minute to type and see if we have any questions. Any other comments from any of our speakers, closing comments you'd like to make? We have a few minutes left. Well, this is Marty. I just would emphasize again, um, if you have some specific questions, call, contact your, your state program. And um, like I said, there's some variables as far as uh, programs are a little bit different from state to state. They have some core services. But contact them and, and um, see if they might have some solutions to some of your AT issues. That's great. Yeah, we're getting a lot of uh, people very appreciative of the presentations today. And uh, we want to join you in that. I think uh, the information we learned today, I know it was eye-opening for me. Uh, and very helpful, and I really do encourage our grantees and partners and everyone in our ARCH network um, to reach out to your AT program. I think the resources would be so helpful uh, to the families that we work with. And thank you very much to all our speakers. It was very uh, informative uh, and extremely helpful. So with that, I would like to remind you all to please uh, respond to the quick uh, evaluation survey. You will get when you close out of here. There'll be a link, uh, but you'll also get something in your email. So again, thank you very much to all of our speakers uh, and to Victoria for helping to pull this all together today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.